Hi, I'm Kenan Celtic. I'm a reconstructive urologist at the Crane Center for Transgender Surgery here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Today, we're going to talk about robotic peritoneal flap vaginoplasty. Robotic peritoneal flap vaginoplasty is also known as peritoneal pull-through vaginoplasty. This is a newer technique for gender-affirming vaginoplasty. This technique allows for the use of, of additional tissue for creation of the vaginal canal. Robotic peritoneal flap vaginoplasty is good for both people who have already had a vaginoplasty surgery but subsequently lost their vaginal depth, um, and it can be used to restore that vaginal depth. It's also useful for people who have never undergone vaginoplasty before in, in, in the cases of primary vaginoplasty. Before we go any further, I want to take a moment to introduce you to me. I'm Kenan Celtic. Um, a bit about my education and my 15-year journey to become a bottom surgeon here. Um, I, I did my undergraduate degree at UC Berkeley here in the Bay Area. And then I moved to New York City and went to Columbia University, where I did my Master of Science. Thereafter, I did my medical education, my MD at a Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. At that point, I moved across the country. I moved to Houston, Texas. I moved to, I, I did my five-year urological surgery residency at Houston Methodist Hospital. And then I was fortunate, actually, during that five-year training period to connect with Richard Santucci and Curtis Crane at the Austin office. Um, and they took me uh, under their wing and, and mentored me uh, on bottom surgery. And so I was quite fortunate that by the end of my urology training, I knew that I wanted to do bottom surgery as well. So I was uh, I went to back to New York City to Mount Sinai Hospital, where I did my fellowship in reconstructive urology and gender affirming genital surgery, working with both Miroslav Georgievic, Rajvir Prohit, and, and Robert Valenzuela. Next is uh, going to go over the agenda. We've already done the introduction part, but the next we'll be talking about uh, anatomy, relevant anatomy with regard to this procedure. Then we'll talk about how robotic peritoneal flat vaginoplasty is performed. And we'll take a moment to talk about the strengths of the peritoneal flat vaginoplasty. And we'll talk about the risks inherent in the surgery itself. We'll talk about alternative procedures. And then we're going to give you information about contacting us. Now to talk about anatomy relevant to robotic peritoneal flap vaginoplasty. Firstly, it's important to know what peritoneum is. Peritoneum is actually the internal lining tissue inside your abdominal and pelvic cavities. It covers all of the contents in there, covers all of your intestines and all the other organs inside your belly. Its job inside your belly is to make a small amount of lubricating fluid. It's called peritoneal fluid. And it's also very slippery. So it helps uh, lubricate all of your intestines and everything that it lines so they can slide across each other nicely. So once we turn these, this layer of peritoneum inside your vagina, it will continue to produce that peritoneal fluid and also aid in kind of giving you a, a slippery internal vagina. Um, so the technique for peritoneal vaginoplasty was actually first described about 50 years ago, but it wasn't until about five years ago that Dr. Zhao and others at NYU first described using the da Vinci surgical robot to perform peritoneal vaginoplasty. In this image actually produced by Dr. Zhao in his uh, landmark paper, um, they describe kind of how the anatomy and the different lining tissues involved in, in you know, are, are moved from pre-op to post-op. So take a look here. On image A on the left, you can see what uh, pre-op anatomy might look like for someone undergoing uh, peritoneal vaginoplasty. Um, so you can see kind of all the you know common organs that are present. Um, you can see the rectum on the left, kind of in the middle on the top, you see the bladder with the urethra passing through the prostate gland and then into the penis. Also, you can see the, the scrotum and the scrotal contents. Whereas on image C on the far right, you can see that the yellow lining, which indicates the peritoneum, has now formed the deepest part of the vagina. Moving down, you can see that the green lining, which started off as scrotal skin, forms kind of the intermediary tissue lining with the blue line, which is the shaft skin, forming the introitus, the most 
external lining part of the vaginal canal. Now we're going to talk about how the surgery is done, how it's performed. It's important at this point for us to differentiate kind of two types of patients undergoing robotic peritoneal flap vaginoplasty. In the first scenario, uh, this would be a person going for restoration of vaginal depth. This is a revision case, someone who's already undergone vaginoplasty for whatever reason, the vaginal canal has closed down and they've elected to use peritoneum to augment, to increase their vaginal depth and capacity. This is very, very different than someone who's never undergone vaginoplasty and is undergoing primary robotic peritoneal flap vaginoplasty. So at first, we're going to start with revision cases. So this is someone starting with a vagina um, that, that has since closed down. So starting, we would start the surgery actually externally. We would explore the deepest aspect of whatever vaginal canal you've got left. At that point, we would open it at its deepest part and widen it in order for it to be able to accommodate the largest dilator we could fit in there. Then we would turn to the surgical robot. And then once inside your abdomen, we would use the surgical robot um, to cut down and to open and find actually where your pre-existing uh, vagina ends. Once that's um, identified, then we'd open it up widely, release any scar tissue or even remove scar tissue that's present around or near and previously operated site, remove all the scar tissue, open up the vaginal space widely, you know, further expand your pre-existing vaginal canal, even if it requires cutting some of that skin and really opening it up so it can accommodate the largest possible dilator. Once that's done, we would free up two large flaps of peritoneum and slide these down and sew them onto the pre-existing vaginal skin using the surgical robot, obviously. Um, once the flaps are attached to your um, vaginal skin, then we would close the top of the vagina, which in some ways might also be considered the deepest part of your vagina, you know, the apex, as we would call it. Um, close that up, and that would conclude the case. In those that are undergoing primary robotic peritoneal flat vaginoplasty, these are people who are not starting with a vagina at the start of the case. Uh, in those scenarios, there's quite a bit more work to be done. Um, much like a traditional per, uh, penile inversion vaginoplasty, um, we would start the case by first removing the scrotal skin. Um, that scrotal skin would be used as, a, as the intermediary kind of graft um, you know, inside the vaginal canal lining. Then we would remove both testicles, which is called orchiectomy. Um, at this point, you're permanently infertile. So it is important that any family planning, any sperm banking be taken care of prior to going to the operating room because this is final. The next step would in, is phallic disassembly. So in this portion of the case, we would remove all of the erectile tissue permanently. Uh, we would preserve a portion of the urethra that we would open up widely and it would form the vaginal vestibule, as well as saving enough urethra for you to be able to urinate freely. Uh, then we would also very carefully uh, remove the head of the penis with kind of a collar of skin underneath, um, as well as taking very, very delicate care to preserve the nerves and blood vessels that supply the head of the phallus, because we're gonna use a portion of that um, what we call glands, the head of the phallus. We're going to preserve a portion of that, and that will form the glands clitoris, the head of the clitoris, as well as um, that that delicate skin here, um, which is I'm sorry, I'm using myself as a prop, but uh, you know that delicate skin beneath uh, the the glands would then also form kind of the inner part of the clitoral hood and labia minora as well. At that point. Um, we would turn to the surgical robot again. So again, how robotic surgery is performed is we would fill up your belly with CO2 gas, makes five to six small incisions across your abdominal wall. That would allow us to put all the robotic instruments into your belly as well as the camera. And then from, from there, I'd go walk across the room, actually in the same OR, but in a different room and use the robotic console to drive the surgical robot. The Da Vinci surgical robot provides me an immersive 3D experience that's also magnified. Um, so it allows for very kind of delicate uh, surgical work. Using the robotic surgical platform, I'd be able to carefully separate your urethra, bladder, and prostate, which lie um, up above your future vagina, from the rectum, which 
with is going to lie below your vagina. Once the space for your vaginal canal is created, then I'd create peritoneal flaps. Again, much like in the revision cases, these peritoneal flaps would then be slid down. But then in this case, I would sew them on to the invaginated phallic skin and scrotal graft. Um, once those are sewn on, then I'd be able to sew and close the top of the vagina, the apex of the vagina that would be comprised of just peritoneum. Then I would return externally complete the vag uh, the labiaplasty rather, creating labia minora and, and labia majora. So finally, actually, in one trip to the operating room, we'll, we would have created all the external features of the vagina, including labia majora, labia minora, clitoris, clitoral hood, the recessed vaginal vestibule on the midline, as well as moving the urethral opening to the feminine, feminine location, as well as creating that full depth vaginal canal we spent so much time talking about. Now it's time to talk about the strengths or benefits of peritoneal vaginoplasty. It's very important that we say right off the bat that currently, as of today, there's no head-to-head -head randomized or prospective trial comparing uh, robotic peritoneal flat vaginoplasty to penile inversion. The studies that do exist out there look at individual techniques um, demonstrating the safety of you know, robotic peritoneal flat vaginoplasty. With that being said, there are a few quite obvious strengths of robotic peritoneal flat vaginoplasty over other techniques. The first and foremost is that it gives us access to additional tissue to construct the vaginal canal. Why this is important? Well, it varies for a few reasons. First, if there's someone with very, very limited external skin for any reason, it could be that a person took prepubescent puberty blockers and did not go through a puberty, or maybe they've had a prior surgery or traumatic injury to their genital area, or any other reason why they, they might have less skin uh, externally. Um, this gives you access to additional skin, be able to construct the vaginal canal largely or mostly out of peritoneum, and that allows us to leave more of that external skin externally for creating labia minora and clitoral hood and all the other you know, important features of the external vagina. For others, some people have adequate skin and still choose to go for robotic peritoneal flat vaginoplasty for their primary vaginoplasty surgery. And in this scenario, they have even more external tissue available. And what I mean by that is not in actuality do they have um, more skin, but what it is is that um, they have more tissue available for creating those external features, the labia minora and others. Because previously, when there was only PIV, there'd be kind of two competing interests for that limited amount of external skin. You needed to invaginate enough to create a full depth vaginal canal, but you also wanted to leave enough laxity externally to be able to create those 3D structures like labia minora and clitoral hood that are you know, quite challenging to construct. And so by having that extra tissue externally, by making the vagina primarily out of peritoneum, we have more tissue externally to work with. The second strength is that the apex of the vagina is anchored deep inside your body. Um, the peritoneal flaps are never fully uh, detached uh, because they're flaps and they have robust blood supply from day one of surgery. Um, but additionally, those those blood vessels actually act as a tether. So it, it you know, it, it, it gives your um, vagina an anchoring deep inside your body. The third strength is that, um, you know, when this technique was first described, you know, we initially thought that we were going to create a fully self-lubricating, self-cleaning vagina, which peritoneal flap vaginoplasty does not provide. But what it does provide is a little bit of extra moisture. Um, what I tell all patients is that um, some people make a ton of fluid, so much that they have to wear a pad. Others make no fluid whatsoever. And it's no different than if they had, you know, a PIV or some other um, skin-lined vaginal vaginoplasty technique. But the vast majority of people do make some fluid, it's not particularly useful. It doesn't get them away from needing lubrication for sex or dilation. It doesn't decrease the frequency that they need to do dilation. And it doesn't change the frequency that they need to, to do self-care such as douching or cleaning their vaginal canal. So what it does provide is some moisture. 
like, a, you know, and, and I guess the final piece is that, you know, we should take a minute to talk about the aftercare um, after vaginoplasty of any form, I, 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 I believe, uh, at least any form that I offer, um, you know, lifelong vaginal dilation is something that every patient should expect to do. Um, and that goes for, for robotic peritoneal flap vaginoplasty as well. It's very important that you dilate every day using water soluble external lubrication. Uh, this will be also needed if you decide to have sex afterwards as well. Douching is an individual process. I'd say that most, you know, most of, often I'll recommend people douche, you know, once or twice a week using, you know, a variety of kind of unscented uh, or just even using water. But other um, people feel they need to to douche more more often than um, kind of how often I recommend. You know, and, and that's often fine too, but I would say discuss it with your surgeon, but, you know, this largely doesn't uh, change the frequency that you need to uh, do any form of self-care, quite frankly. Now we're going to take a moment to talk about the risks. Like any surgery, there are many possible risks. I'm listing here, you know, many of the very you know, many of the possibilities of, of risks that could, you know, and complications that could take place. Um, anytime you put a knife to skin, there's always a risk of bleeding or hematoma or the possible need for transfusion, right? Genital tissues have a very robust blood supply, and as such, you know, bleeding is always a risk possibility. Infection, abscess, and sepsis are always possibilities for infection, but, uh, you know, or in any and most types of surgery. But with that being said, we give you a large dose of antibiotics um, to kind of mitigate those risks. Hernia is a possibility because of those robotic port sites, those um, cuts inside your abdominal wall to allow all the robotic ports in. Um, with that being said, most of the robotic instruments are only eight millimeters and the risk of herniation into those holes is very, very small because they're because of their small size. Prolonged pain or changes in sensation are possibilities, um, as is the there is a you know small risk of loss of the ability to orgasm. Asymmetries and scarring and prolonged swelling are quite common. I mean, or not common, but extreme swelling is very common. Scarring and, and asymmetry, those are actually kind of related to each other because each individual makes scar individual to themselves. Some people make thick scars and thin scars. Some people make contracted scars or relaxed scars, and this is varies between individuals. Uh, with regard to your urinary tract, there's a risk of urinary urethral strictures or, or changes to your urinary habits, voiding dysfunction. Bowel obstruction or bowel dysfunction is a possibility. Um, fistulae, which are abnormal connections between two hollow structures, such as between your vagina and your rectum or vagina and urethra are possible. Injury to nearby organs, such as the rectum, urethra, bladder, and prostate are possible when we're separating those organs to create the vaginal canal space. Granulation tissue is a kind of an uh, a natural tissue that can form inside the vaginal canal. Um, it typically isn't dangerous, but it can lead to kind of ongoing small volume bleeding inside the vaginal canal space. Every once in a while, someone will have, um, you know, more than a small amount, but that's um, quite uncommon, but it's more of an annoyance than anything. Prolonged drainage is always a possibility. It's kind of the point of peritoneal vaginoplasty for some people, having that additional fluid. Wound healing complications, wound breakdown, separation of incisions or bits of skin dying are possibilities. Inadequate vaginal depth or vaginal stenosis, which is the process where your body tries to close down your vaginal canal, unfortunately are still possibilities. And that's the right reason why we will recommend that you dilate multiple times a day, particularly at the beginning and then um, potentially for the rest of your life. Obviously, the exact results of the surgery can't be guaranteed. There's always a possible need for additional revision, although it's not our plan ever. Uh, there's, you know, no no guarantee that this will completely resolve your gender dysphoria um, if you have that. And, and this surgery, by definition, involves permanent loss of your fertility and is irreversible. Finally, we'll talk about alternative um, options, you know, other than this surgery. The first I would say would be a single stage penile inversion would probably be the most kind of common alternative. 
uh, others offer um, a two-stage penile inversion surgery, penile inversion vaginoplasty surgery. Colon vaginoplasty is often spoken about in the kind of the similar way as peritoneal flap vaginoplasties as well. It's often, it can be used for both primary and revision surgeries. With that being said, bowel tends to have, um, it tends to be a bit more risky because when you, you can harvest a bit of bowel to use for the vagina, but when you put the intestines back together so that the food that you eat comes out your bottom after surgery, um, that connection point can have complications such as leaking, where you leak stool into your belly, forms a large abscess. You know, it's just, a, it's a more sensitive organ. And, and, and so, you know, I think that, you know, it, it's a little bit more um, risky relative to peritoneal vaginoplasty. Skin graft vaginoplasty is is similar to penile inversion, but also can involve taking skin grafts from other places in your body to line the vaginal canal or elsewhere. Minimal depth or zero depth vaginoplasty, also called vulvoplasty alone. This involves creating all the external features of the vagina without a functional vaginal canal. And then finally, for the, probably the most conservative of all, um, you know, it's kind of an iteration of a nullification type procedure would be something like having just a panectomy or just orchiectomy done without a vaginoplasty. You know, and these are also options for you. If, if, if um, you know, talking about after learning about robotic peritoneal flap, it doesn't seem like something that you'd be interested in. So thank you um, for listening to this. Um, again, my name is Kenan Celtic. I'm a reconstructive urologist here at the Crane Center for Transgender Surgery in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, or you can see our phone number on the screen. Um, you can reach, you know, you can find us on Instagram. Our website is craneCTS.com. And if you're interested in learning more, scheduling surgery or, or anything at all, um, email us at careception at craneCTS.com. Well, thanks so much and speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.